Welcome to this short lecture on aspiration in enterally or tube-fed adults. Aspiration is defined as oral pharyngeal secretions and or regurgitated gastric contents introduced into the lung. According to recent studies, aspiration events occur in 22% to 36% of acutely ill patients and these were measured in four hour intervals of nursing evaluation at patient bedside. Half of mechanically ventilated patients who were also tube fed aspirate content into the lungs. So this is something that occurs very frequently in the hospital population of patients who are tube fed. A single aspiration event doesn't necessarily cause pneumonia but accumulating aspiration events does lead to an increased risk of developing pneumonia. And currently there are no bedside tests that accurately detect microaspirations of gastric or oral content into the lung. Prevention or minimizing risk of aspiration therefore is very important to reduce the risk of pneumonia in hospitalized patients. It is estimated that 5 to 15 percent of pneumonias in the hospital population are caused by microaspirations of oral and GI content. Now on this slide I want to show you a barium swallow study that was conducted in a young girl who had cerebral palsy. You'll note that the first swallow was done well. Normally, we have a normal swallow here of oral content going into the um, esophagus and stomach, but we do see just a little bit of pooling of material here. Now watch the second swallow and you can see that it does aspirate into the lung. So I'll show you that clip once more without interruption. And we call this silent aspiration because we had um, no indications that this was going on during her feeding. What we did have is over the course of a year uh, this young lady had frequent hospitalizations for pneumonia and uh, it was suspected that perhaps this might be going on and even though we tried different things modifying her diet she was not able to safely swallow food uh, with every bite consistently so she did have to go to a tube feeding. So what are the major risk factors for aspiration? A person who has been intubated may have some problems swallowing a couple of days uh, up to two or three days after uh, they've been extubated so they'll need to be checked. Uh, patients who are suffering from uh, vomiting episodes, patients who have persistently high gastric residual volumes left in their stomachs and we'll talk more about that in just a minute, patients who have to be in a supine position for an extended period of time, patients with a history of aspiration, patients with a neuromuscular problem much like the young lady in our previous video clip, patients who are in um, a position of being sedated or they've had a change in their mental status like uh, you might see in a stroke patient and abnormalities of the aerodigestive tract. Minor risk factors for aspiration include feeding a patient boluses rather than a, con a continuous drip. Patients who have a large bore nasoenteric tube. Patients who are suffering from delayed gastric emptying. The stomach is not emptying quickly enough and so they, they build up. And this could be due to a number of things, uh, medications or patient conditions. It might be that a patient's um, is diabetic and their blood sugar is poorly controlled, this can cause delayed gastric emptying. Number of other issues. Older person, a patient who's had chest or abdominal trauma, 
even a malpositioned feeding tube can contribute to aspiration risk. And in one, a couple of actually of interesting studies, when patients were moved from the ICU where the ratio of nurses to patients is much smaller, um, when they were moved to the floor where they get less frequent nurse contact, uh, aspiration and aspiration events were much higher in the tube fed population. So what can we do to prevent this? Standard uh, intervention includes keeping the patient's bed elevated somewhere between 30 to 40, some studies say 45 degrees unless it's contraindicated. Limit the use of sedation as much as possible so that the patient is able to swallow their own secretions. Assess the placement of the feeding tube every four hours to make sure that it hasn't migrated into an area that it shouldn't. This is why nurses will often mark the entry point of the tube into the body with a marker and go back and check that length. Assess tube feeding tolerance of patients receiving gastric tube feedings, in other words, a tube going right into the stomach, and we'll talk more about that. Avoid bolus feedings for patients at increased risk of aspiration. They do better with a drip and possibly even feeding into the jejunum. For patients who have uh, been intubated for more than two days, it's good to get a swallow evaluation once that tube comes out to make sure they're able to swallow safely. And for those with an endotracheal cuff, it's good to keep those levels above 20 centimeters. Um, measures less than that can predispose the patient to pneumonia. Some studies have shown that using a kinetic bed can help reduce aspiration events because it can elevate the patient and sort of keep them turned on their right side. However, they are expensive and in some patients their use is contraindicated. I want to talk a little bit about gastric residual volume or GRV because unfortunately Many healthcare providers only look at the GRV and if uh, this is interpreted out of its context, the tube feeding actually gets held. In other words, they don't feed the patient the full volume of calories needed per day. In the critically ill population, it's suggested that the GRV be checked every four hours. A gastric residual volume somewhere between 250 and 500 mils is completely acceptable. We're talking about one to two cups. There are many practitioners who will hold a, gat, their, a patient's tube feeding with a GRV as little as 100 or even 200. It's not necessary to hold a feeding. If the patient seems to be tolerating their formula uh, then there's no indication that anything else is going on, GRV should not be the sole criterion that is used to hold a feeding from the patient. It needs to be interpreted in the context of clinical evaluation. For example, does the patient's abdomen seem distended? Are they complaining with abdominal pain? Is the patient passing flatus in stool? And even if um, we do have an elevated gastric residual volume, and even if some of these symptoms are present, they may be treated with a prokinetic agent to help the stomach to empty. The point is not to rush and hold the patient's feeding uh, just because there's an issue. We can also offer the patient a small bowel feeding where we take that tube port and put it below the ligament of treats for patients with persistent intolerance to gastric feeding and with documented aspiration. So a final word about gastric residual volumes. There are other things that can cause these to be elevated besides a patient's um, you know, tube feeding intolerance. It could be they have hyperglycemia, they're on medications that can reduce the activity of the stomach, increased intracranial pressure, electrolyte abnormalities, ischemia, sepsis, burns, 
even the type of formula. So again, tube feeding intolerance isn't the only reason that a patient might have an elevated recurring GRV. One other thing to mention, many times you'll see an elevated GRV on the very first enteral feeding, but this will decrease over time. And finally, checking the GRV is problematic. It can be influenced by just where the tip is positioned in the stomach, how the patient is positioned, and the patency or size of the tube. So fortunately, we are seeing more and more facilities rely less on the GRV to make decisions about holding the tube feeding on a patient. So the final comment, GRV is not a reliable measure for measuring gastric content and there's little correlation between aspiration and GRV levels. The important thing to remember is not to rely completely on it to hold a patient's feedings. They should be used in the context of other indicators of feeding tolerance. Using the GRV inappropriately can result in persistent underfeeding of patients and we all know that this has devastating effects on recovery and length of stay. Patients need to meet their calorie goals in order to heal. Several recent studies have shown that using a standard protocol for addressing aspiration risk results in optimal patient outcomes. Here's an acrostic to help remember all of the appropriate strategies to minimize aspiration risk. First, assess risk factors of the patient. Consider a small bowel tube placement. Use prokinetic agents to help the stomach to empty for gastric feeds. Interpret the GRV with caution. Keep the head of the bed elevated somewhere between 30 and 45 degrees. Aspirate subglottic secretions. You can check the pH of those, and if it's elevated pH, then that suggests that perhaps this is coming from the stomach. Keep the patient on his or her right side. Instead of bolus feeds, consider continuous infusion. It's also important to maintain good oral health while the patient is being tube fed so that the microbial load in the mouth is reduced and if those secretions get aspirated into the lungs, they won't be, uh, well, they won't have a high microbial load. And of course, good nursing care, good monitoring of the patient. So, as we said, good monitoring done by the nurse. Uh, checking tube placement is another way to reduce the risk of aspiration. So check the length of the external portion of the feeding. Again, these are usually marked and um, can make sure it hasn't migrated. Review routine chest and abdominal radiographs for the uh, portal end of the tube. Watch for changes in volume of aspirate from the feeding tube and measure the pH of tube aspirates if the feeding is interrupted for more than an hour.